right. Good morning. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? Why don't we stand up on our feet? How many came ready to worship the Lord this morning? The Lord is good. Amen. He endures forever. He's faithful. His grace is sufficient for us. I mean, we got everything that we could ever hope for in this life. Amen. Amen. And the best is yet to come. Yes, amen. So uh, glory to God. Father, we worship you. We say welcome those who are joining us online this morning. Uh, Welcome to our service. Uh, Set this time aside. Even though you might not be here in the building, you can worship with us right from where you're at. So uh, join with us as we just worship the King today. Father, we thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. Father, your mercies endure forever and ever. Father, you love us with a love that we truly cannot even comprehend. But Father, we worship you today, and we thank you that you be lifted up, Father. And as you are, people would be drawn to you, Father. You deserve all the glory, all the honor. And this, everything that we are is about you, Father. It's about you and your goodness. And we're grateful for your faithfulness to us and your love with which you loved us. You deserve the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. shall be filled. Amen. Amen. Do you desire more of God? Hallelujah. He wants to fill you yes. to overflowing. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. It's, it's, it's all on us. Uh, I say it all the time that we have a tendency to clutter our lives with things and that pushes our time and our fellowship away from the Father. And uh, if we would push that stuff aside and put God right where he needs to be, we'd have more time to enjoy the things that he wants us to have. Amen? Amen. It's all about priorities. But, Father, we worship you. We thank you for your amazing love, for your goodness, your grace, and your forgiveness, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 
I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Sing that again. I'm forgiven. Aren't you glad? Father, thank you. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, and your spirit lives within me, because you died. Confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Lift your voices, church. Worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the very air we breathe, Father.
This is the air I breathe. You are holy presence, living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I, I'm desperate for. you we are lost but because we are in you we are seated in heavenly places father hallelujah your word is a lamp to our feet it's a light to our path father we hide your word in our heart that we would not sin against you father we are never at a loss we always know because we have the greater one living on the inside of us and we're thankful that we've been brought near by the blood of jesus when we once were far off christ your blood was shed and brought us near and we're thankful for the salvation that we have in you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
You be glorified in our midst today. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, your love. We thank you that as you're lifted up, people would be drawn to you. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Let's stay in an attitude of worship as uh, as we prepare to uh, to give of our substance. Amen. Uh, he, we worship him. I'm glad you guys are excited about that. We're excited about Hallelujah. it because uh, when we sow seed, the Lord causes increase to come into our life. Amen. And uh, we don't stand up here. And I, I have to be totally honest with you. I don't stand up here in the hopes that we're going to get a big offering. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. I really am because God supplies our needs Amen. according to his riches and glory. Amen. The reason as a pastor we admonish the church and the sheep to give is so that God can bring increase into your life. Yes. And if you're increased, the church will be increased. You, you see how that works. So, so if, you, if you believe that today, then obey God. The most important thing you can do oh, no. is obey what the Spirit of God is prompting you to do. Uh, we know uh, from his word that he said to bring your tithe into the storehouse, right? right? And, uh, and prove him this day that he would not open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on our life that we wouldn't have room to contain it. Amen? Uh, and and it, it, if we're to be a blessing, then we have to have some substance, right? You say that again. Can we be a blessing with nothing in our pocket? Nope. We could tell people how much we love them. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in James it talks about a faith without works. Yeah. Right? That's I'll right. show you my faith by my works. That's right. right? What good does it do to tell someone, oh, brother, you know, you see your brother in need. And, uh, and we don't do anything about their physical need. We just tell them, hey, listen, God loves you so much. Uh, stay warm. Have a nice day. And they're like, I have no clothes, I have no food, but God loves me. But when we, ha- we say that same thing and we back it up with, hey, listen, do you have a place to stay? If not, I can put you up somewhere. Are you hungry? Come with me. We'll get you a nice meal and do all those kind of things. But it takes, God knows it takes finances to do yes, those things, yeah. right? And, uh, and so he gave us the, the formula how to have sufficiency and how to have surplus and, uh, and the church should be a place of surplus, not a place of our hands looking for free stuff, right? We should be the ones, and we are, thank God, and, and the Lord's increasing us even more. But uh, I want the, the, the rest of the church to be increased in this. You know, I was reading this morning in, uh, in I, I guess I should have said, if you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. That's just make sure you get one, but you guys know that already. And if you're, if you're sewing online, you can do it at our website, abundantgracechurch.com, or you can text it. The number's on the screen, 732-479-8787. Uh, sowing seed and giving and offerings is the most exciting thing that we can do. Yes, you know, yeah. just like Amen. a farmer, it, he needs land to plant his crops, right? And yes. so when he gets a nice piece of land, if he just looks at that and says, wow, I hope I get a crop next year, and, and someone says, well, what did you plant? Okay. And he said, oh, no, I just have the land. That should be good enough, right? No, you need to plant something. Otherwise, you're going to have a nice dirt field, acres of it, you know, <laughs> probably the nicest dirt around, but that's all you'll have. Uh, we need to sow something, amen? amen. And uh, I was reading in Proverbs this morning, and, uh, and this is from the Amplified Bible. It says this in verse 9, Proverbs chapter 3, and verse 9 and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. And with the first fruits of all your crops. That means your income. That's what he says. And then there's a bunch of little scriptures that back that up in the Amplified. Malachi, we know, Deuteronomy 26, Luke 14. And verse 10 says, then, then. So he gives us the command and then he gives us the promise. Right? He gives us what we're supposed to do and then he shows us this is what will happen if you'll do this in obedience and faith. Then, verse 10, your barns will be abundantly filled. How many wants abundantly filled barns? Thank you, Lord. Thank yes, you, Lord. so that we can be a blessing without you going into hawk over it. Right? So then your barns will be abundantly filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Glory to God. That is the purpose of, of sowing and reaping. And that is the purpose God has established his covenant in the earth and and caused increase to come to us so that he can establish his covenant. Amen. So I know that I'm 
if you, you know, the expression preaching to the choir, because you guys know this and, uh, and you're, you're blessed because of it. Can someone agree and say, amen, amen. we amen. are blessed because of that principle. So, uh, if you have your offering and you got it ready, why don't we stand up on our feet? Let's hold it up to the Lord. Thank him that it's he is the one who causes increase to come into our lives, right? He's the one who, who, uh, who brings increase into us, into our lives. And, uh, and, and if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have anything. He's a source of every good thing that we have. Amen. And uh, so we acknowledge him with that. So, Father, we thank you that we sow our seed today. Father, we sow it willingly. We sow it quickly. We sow it gladly. Glad to do it. Joy in our heart. Father, knowing what it's going to produce, that our seed is going to be scattered. It's going to help those in, in the Samoan Islands. It's going to help those in, in, in Haiti. It's going to help those in, uh, in, in uh, the Philippines, everywhere, in our, in our area. In our area, it's going to help those that are in our very area who come in these doors so we can help them and supply their physical needs. And so, Father, as we sow today in faith and obedience to your word, I speak blessings over the people, Father. That they be increased, that you'd cause increase to come into their life, that you would rebuke the devourer for our sake, Father. You'd multiply our seed, Father. And we thank you that it is coming back to us. On many, many waves, Father. The seed that we're sowing now is coming back. Harvest coming up all over the place, Lord. You're meeting every one of our needs. You're paying every bill. You're reducing every debt. According to your word, you said it, and we believe it. And we thank you that we are seeing the fruit of our obedience. Father, may you be glorified in this. Bring honor to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. You may receive the offering. Uh, let me see what we're doing. I want more of you. I need less of me. Fill me with And I'll be satisfied with nothing less than more of you in me. One more time. I was way off key. I'll be satisfied with nothing less than more of you in me. It was my fault. I start off in the wrong key. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank God he thinks we're perfect. Oh, hey, morning, Abundant Grace Church family. Glad you guys are here. I also want to welcome you guys joining us via live stream. Um, before we get started with the announcement we have, we have an announcement this morning because we keep checking things off our announcement list. So glory to God. Um, glad for see everybody that came out last week for the church picnic. It was a great success. I don't know about you guys. I ate way too much. Um, we really didn't need the ice cream truck. But hallelujah, we had one anyway, and judging by the line, you guys enjoyed it too. So hallelujah, glory to God. So um, before we get started with the announcements, anybody here joining us for the first time, raise up your hand. We want to say hello. Well, glory to God, we are glad you guys are here. Now we're just going to ask you to do one more thing, is just stand up and sing the next song in the right key. But you don't have to. But please, please see us at the reception desk after service so we can get to know a little bit more about you. So the one announcement, Men of Abundant Grace Church, you know what, it's October 3rd. You know, the Word of God talks about in the last days, time will go by exponentially, and I'm saying it's October 3rd, and I can't believe that it's October 3rd. So we have the men's conference, which is Saturday, October 23rd, and the reason why I said that is that's going to be here before we know it. So, guys, we need you to sign up for that. Um, like I said, time's coming quick. It's going to be October 23rd. It's going to feel like it tomorrow. So please sign up. It's going to be uh, starting at 9 a.m. that morning, Saturday morning. Uh, myself and Pastor Eddie are going to be ministering. 
awesome time of fellowship. We have a couple of other churches that are also going to participate and come. Uh, some of uh, people that passed already graduated Rama with their churches and, and Miss Carol, and they're, they're going to be some other guys here. And it's going to be a great time of fellowship. You know, when I think about that, I always think about when we go out to the men's conference at Rama and they have that luncheon afternoon where there's like 2,000 guys sitting around having lunch, and you get to know people from all over the country, all over the world. I mean, I remember one year Paul was there. We're sitting across from a guy that was from Nigeria. You know, we can really, when we interact in fellowship, iron sharpens iron, right? You know, somebody there might have something to say to you that want, they want, it's going to bless you. You know, we need to fellowship. We need to plug into the word. But the other side of this, one o'clock, we're going to have a barbecue catered by local smoke barbecue. And I'm going to read you the menu because even if you get excited about the food and come, you're going to come and get excited about the word. Amen. So that menu is beef brisket, St. Louis ribs, pulled chicken, barbecue baked beans, coleslaw, macaroni and cheese, and cornbread. And the cost is $25 per guy. And who knows, maybe even a cornhole tournament will break out or something. So that has a tendency to happen as well. So glory to God. Guys, sign up. Uh, if you want to pay today, that's awesome too. I'll be out at the reception desk after service. So come see me. If you got any more questions about it, we're here. So, Pastor. Brother. <laughs> no, not to this one. <laughs> not to this one. Glory to God. Amen. Yeah, so maybe we'll play some cornhole too. Pastor Frank's on a roll with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, invite someone though. You know, you could bring a friend, invite them, and, uh, and, and you know what? Pay for them too. <laughs> That'll be a real blessing to them, right? Uh, that's why we need to have surplus, right? For those reasons. Glory to God. So we serve a God. That is more than enough. You know, God is not satisfied. The 23rd Psalm tells us that um, God is, he's not just satisfied with a full cup. I mean, although a full cup is good, right? I mean, it's better than a half a cup. Um, but he's not satisfied with just a full cup. What does it say? He makes our cup overflow, overflow. You know, so how many have ever, you know, had something poured in their drink? What would you think? If a server at the restaurant was pouring some water into your cup and he got it right to the top and he just kept pouring it over, you're, you're like, dude, can you, it's all over. The, oh, I know. I, I just want you to have more than enough, more than enough, right? That's how God looks at us. He says, I know you're blessed, but I'm not just going to stop there. I want you to have more than enough, sir, plus, sir, plus. That's a God we serve. Anybody tells you different, get away from them. Because they don't know the truth. But the truth is, God has established his covenant in this earth, causing us to increase. Not to be a bunch of braggadocious, prideful people who brag on it. No, so that we can be a blessing to others. And if God sees that he can get it to you, if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Right? Like a conduit. And, uh, and that's the purpose of the church. Amen? To lack in no good thing, to have every need met according to his riches and glory. So, uh, so we're excited about the men's conference. That's going to be good, and we'd love to see a bunch of men there. So make sure you plan accordingly and tell your friends now so that you don't spring it on them the day before. Right? So uh, glory to God. Well, uh, why, don't we, why don't we pray together as we touch God's word here this morning and uh, that we'll hear exactly what he wants for us to hear today. I got some things in my heart. And, uh, and, you know, the word, it's always about Jesus, right? Exalting him and his word, you know, not on a quest to, to get our own point of view across. It's about the word of God. And so, Father, as we open your word and we study it, we thank you that your word produces life in us, Father. Your word is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. It lights the way. It shows us where to go, what to do, what not to do. You've given us the Holy Ghost to lead us and guide us and quicken us and strengthen us. And we ask that you do that today, Father. As we honor your word, we thank you that you will reveal yourself to us, Father. Revelation knowledge, impartations of truth. Father, you know what we need to hear. I ask that you speak through me the word of life that will produce in our lives. And, Father, we determine today that as you talk to us, that we'll not just be hearers, but we will be those who put it into practice and who bear the fruit thereof. 
And we thank you that you be glorified in all that's said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory be to God. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, the subject of mercy and repentance. Right? What those two things are, what God's word says about it, and, uh, and, and Jesus, his instruction while he was on the earth. Mercy and then repentance. They always go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. And so I want to look at a couple examples this morning of that. And, uh, and, and if you have your Bible, I want you to open up to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 19. And we're going to start here in this story, in the Gospels, Luke's account, uh, beginning in verse 1. And uh, while you're turning there, I want us to remember the verse of Scripture found in 1 John 1, 9 that says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But to be forgiven of sin, confession must precede that, right? And, uh, and that's why the scriptures also tell us in Romans that with the mouth, uh, with the heart man believes, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And that has to do with... Um, all the areas of our life, not only in receiving salvation and forgiveness, uh, but it has to do with healing too. It has to do with uh, receiving finances. It has to do with all those kind of things because prosperity and healing is all God's mercy. It's all part of the mercy of God. Mercy is, is not getting what you do deserve, right? Grace is getting... Uh, wait, did I say it the other way? No. Mercy is being, someone having mercy on you is not getting the punishment or the recompense that you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, right? God's help. He's gracious to us, but, but they go hand in hand. But the, the, the point in what I want us to really look at today, and we're going to see this through Scripture through the example in the Gospels and, and some other instances in Scripture, that we serve a good God, not a God that's looking to destroy us. If he wanted to destroy us, let's get this clear real quick, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. <laughs> we were already doomed. Right? He, do, he's not, he doesn't, does everybody agree with me this morning? He's not looking to destroy us. He's not looking to ruin our lives. He's not looking to, you know, swat us right off the planet. Because if, that if that's what he wanted, that happened in the garden. And we were already doomed at that point. But the contrary, contrary to that, is the truth is that God so loved the world that he had to come up with a plan to pay for man's sin. So he gave his very, he can only pay with sin, pay for sin with something that was sinless. You can't, they did it with sacrifices, but there was still sin. It was a covering. It was never a redemption, right? So Jesus had to come, who knew no sin, became sin, so that we can be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So to, so to ever think contrary to that or, or, or to say that, you know, God is the reason this has happened, and this is my lot in life, and God's trying to teach me something through this pain and sickness. Well, he's not trying to teach you something, but you can learn something from it. That's why the scriptures say, count it all joy. Not because it is fun, but count it all joy when you fall into problems because the trying of your faith is going to produce great recompense and reward in your life. Right? It'll produce patience. It'll, it'll cause us. And the thing that the enemy meant for evil, God will turn around for good. And, and, and so, uh, so he is not, and I wanted to establish that, God is not uh, out to get us in any way, shape, or form. Now, I know there's a lot of religious thinking and teaching, uh, you know, coming uh, from, from um, uh, generations of, of religion that say that God is, you know, out to get you. You better watch. God is watching. Well, he is watching. He is watching, but he's looking for ways to help us. The devil's watching also, and he's looking for ways to destroy us. And they get it mixed up. 
God is not the one behind the evil that we see in the world. God is not behind that. And the enemy wants everyone to believe that it's God. If God is so good, why is he letting this happen? Has anybody ever heard that before? Well, because God is not in charge of what goes on in this realm. The devil is the God of this world. But if you check in heaven and the record's up there and look at the news roll, there's nothing happening bad there. Everybody's well supplied, happy, no killing, no floods, fire, none of that stuff. Everybody's rich, and they all love each other. It's a great place. And you know who's in charge there? God. God is in charge there. So, so contrary to what the enemy wants people to believe, that God is the reason why things are happening in the earth today. And it's, it's not true at all. Satan is the God of this world. Now, as believers, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? We have, does anybody know what a diplomat is? Has everybody heard the term diplomatic immunity? Right? They could be here, but they're not governed by our laws. And when someone tries to impose our laws on them, they hold up their card. No trespassing. I have diplomatic immunity. I'm a citizen of another country, and I represent that country. Does everybody see what I'm saying here? Are we citizens of another country? Yes, we are. We are. And are we to represent that country? Yes. So when the enemy comes to us with a whole bag full of garbage, we are not subject to it. Now, if we, he'll allow us to believe differently and we yield to that, then we're going to take whatever's in the bag. And if we take what's in the bag and it's bad, then we say, oh, that's the sovereignty of God. And it's not true. It's not true. It's not true at all, not even a little bit. God has made provision for us. He told us, you are an ambassador here on this earth. Act like an ambassador. If it's not from me and it's not from your country of origin, which is heaven for us, then refuse it. You have diplomatic immunity. You know, I was reading uh, Dr. Kenneth Hagin, his faith food, and he said he learned this a while ago, that there was a piece of Uh, grass. I don't know if anyone has read this. It's in the faith food recently Um, in Washington, D.C. that the caretaker of this piece of property, he put up this little fence and it was, you know, whatever, a piece of grassy area and people used to cut right across it and it destroyed this and it really upset this guy because he put his all his effort into it. So he put a little fence around it, but the fence was low to the ground. So people would just step over the fence and keep trespassing. So finally, he put up a sign. Gentlemen will not, and no one else will trespass on this grass. And he posted that sign there, and it took care of the problem. And so Brother Hagin said, you know what? That's what we need to do. And we may not see it, but spiritually put up a sign on the inside that says, no, must, no one must trespass here because of who we are in Christ. Amen? So we, 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 we don't deny attacks. The enemy will try to attack you. That's why he's an enemy. He's not a friend. But we have authority over him. Right? We have authority over him. And why am I saying all this? Because I want to establish the fact that God is for us. And if God is for us, who and what could be against us? Nothing can. No devil, no demon, no person, no power, no government. No authority here in this earth can stand against the power and glory of God. None. And you know where he resides? On the inside of us. You don't have to drive down the street or across the country to get to his house to visit with him. You can visit with him in your bedroom, at your kitchen table, in the bathroom, driving in your car. Wherever you're at, you can have a visit with the greater one. And you can hear from him, and he can help you, and he can make you more than a conqueror. And we need that in the, in the earth today, don't we? So God is, say this with me, God is a good God. God is for me. So therefore... Nothing can be against me. If God is on my side, I will not fear. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, uh, let's see how we're going to tie all this mercy and repentance into all that. Well, it certainly has a lot to do with it because uh, being merciful is being good, isn't it? Being kind. 
And we have so many stories in scripture of people who wanted mercy but never showed mercy. Right? We have instances of that all the time. And uh, it, Jesus showed mercy. All throughout the scriptures, he showed mercy. He didn't show compromise. Okay? Let's not get confused. Compromise is not mercy. He didn't show compromise. He didn't show uh, just, I understand. He was pretty emphatic about sin. He didn't, you know, he showed mercy on people who were sinners and told them to go and sin no more. Right? So there is a distinction, and we're going to get into that this morning a little bit. But I want to start off in reading Luke chapter 19, and uh, beginning in verse 1. Now, this is a story... Uh, it's always good for us to, and of course I've, I've done this, but for time's sake, to go back and read the previous verses and then read on after what we're reading today because it keeps the whole thing in context. You know, you could pull one thing out of Scripture. There's a little verse that said Judas went and hung himself. So is that Scripture? People could say, oh, well. So why I'm saying that to you is you can take a verse of Scripture and make it and twist it to say anything you want. But when you read it in context, okay, and, and it backs up with other references, then, it, then, it's, then it's truth, right? So, uh, but we're going to start in the beginning of chapter 19 and verse 1. And, uh, and this is the story about Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, right? Uh, normally don't preach about him much, but we're going to see some, uh, some uh, I think, some life-changing facts about this and, and see how the mercy of God is activated in our life. And this is so important for us, so important for us. Uh, and you see so many, so many facets of, of, of God's word in this that we're going to look at. And I, it's my prayer that we will receive and hear exactly what God wants us to know today. So it says, Jesus entered, I'm reading from uh, the Amplified, Jesus entered Jericho, and was passing through. And there was a man called Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, a superintendent to whom others reported, and he was rich, it says. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, but he could not see because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. He was a little guy, all right? And, and, uh, and so he ran on ahead of the crowd, and climbed up in a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. You know, and, and now just reading this for the first time, I just saw some things here that uh, I had never seen before. Zacchaeus was short, all right? So sometimes when you could walk around with a little chip on your shoulder about that, right? Right? Uh, not that there's anything wrong with being short. I mean, you're the last one to get hit in the crowd because, you know what I mean? So there's, there's, there's something good with that. But um, so the, I'm just thinking, I'm just for the first time looking at this. He was also very rich. Okay? He had a lot of money. Had a lot of stuff. He was a tax collector. And people didn't like the tax. Not was he, he wasn't, he was a superintendent of the, he had tax collectors bring him the money. Okay, they weren't real famous people, just like today they're not real famous people, but, but they certainly weren't in Scripture either. You know, they, they didn't really, uh, the Jews didn't really like the tax collectors much. So, uh, so he had this already going against him. He was short, he had a lot of money, and he took everybody's money. But what do we see here? What do we see here? What's the first thing you see when uh, this is what I just saw anyway, reading this, Zacchaeus heard something about Jesus and wanted to know who Jesus was. He wanted to know who Jesus was. Now, in order for him to get to where Jesus was, because he was short, he had to get on ahead of the crowd and he had to climb up into a tree. Now, if you're short, you, you don't want to make more of a spectacle of yourself and climb up in a tree so everyone can say, oh, look, there's the short tax collector. He has to go in a tree to see who Jesus is, right? Why am I, I'm telling you this because uh, he had a lot of things you would say going against him. 
And, and so in order, in order to, 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 uh, to come to see who Jesus was and learn of him, he had to put his pride to the side. Do you see that? And, and I never saw that before in this, reading it, you know. But I, I intended to speak about that subject today as well. And not even making the connection here. But it's here as well. And pride is, uh, is one of the worst things that as humanity we, we can have in our lives is pride. Pride is evil. Pride, the scriptures say, is, is as the sin of witchcraft. It's rebellion. And it's the very thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven, right? It was pride. And, 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 and now we only view pride as somebody who walks around bragging about themselves. And that sure is a form of pride. But being insecure, being insecure, being worried about yourself and what other people think about you is also a form of pride that we don't really connect the dots there. You know, there's the saying, um, I'm so, uh, uh, I'm so uh, humble, I'm proud of my humility. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, there's that side of pride. And that's the kind that you don't really, like I said, connect the dots. And so we operate in that quite a bit. And really, the scriptures say that we get resisted from God when that's operating in our lives. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? He gives grace. He gives Grace is God's help. He gives his help to the humble. He gives help to the humble. He gives help to the, uh, the person who wants to know him and is not embarrassed because of his stature or any other thing about him, but is willing to climb up in a tree and be mocked and ridiculed. That person's going to get help. But the person who says, oh, man, they, they make fun of me as it is. You think I'm going to climb up in a tree so everybody can see how short I am? And ask, why are you in a tree? And then I have to tell them, well, because you don't know, I'm short. Right? Pride stands in the way. And, and, and it easily could have kept him from coming to Christ. Now, we know you could see the mercy of God in this. So incredible. Zacchaeus was not a believer at this point. He was not a believer. So is God's mercy just for the believers? Or is it for everybody? It's for everyone. It's for everyone. It's certainly attainable to those who will humble themselves. Okay? Which is confession. Everybody with me on this? If we want his help, then we are going to have to humble ourselves and, and admit a few things so that we can receive his help, his grace. We have to do that. That's, there's no shame in that. Pride will stop you from doing that. And that causes you to do without God's help and blessing on your life. I don't want to live a half a second without God's help and blessing on my life. Because I know that I have an enemy that's looking for every opportunity to do his best to cause destruction in my life. I'm not going to help him. Right? So Zacchaeus wasn't born again, if you will, at, the, at this time. Didn't know Jesus in that type of way. But he heard and had to hear some things. And he knew that Jesus was coming through town. Short, rich, or not, made no difference to him. He was climbing up in a tree to see who this guy was. Now Jesus, being led of the Spirit, of all the people, that were following him that day. You talk about God being the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. This was a setup from many uh, uh, millenniums that Zacchaeus would be up in this tree to meet Jesus. But had not, and this is why, listen, we talk a lot about sovereignty. Our will has everything to do <laughs> with that. Okay, God may have had this plan from the beginning of time. But had Zacchaeus yielded to pride, 
and began to reason in his own mind, well, people are going to make fun of me. They already don't like me. Uh, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll meet him some other time when no one's around. Was it still God's will that Zacchaeus was to meet Jesus that day? Yes, it was. Did it happen if he refused to climb the tree? It didn't. So do we say, well, then it was just God's will that, I mean, what, what is it? Is it God's will that he was to meet him? Or did God change his mind in the midstream? He doesn't. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, 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 the most important thing about our walk in salvation is the fact that God will not change his mind. If he was to change his mind, our faith is based on nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. But the fact, it's not that he, 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 he can change, but he doesn't want to change. He can't change. Does everybody understand that? It's not even a choice that he chooses. Not He cannot change. We change. We humble ourselves. We choose whether we're going to obey, whether we're going to listen, or we're going to yield to our flesh. There's a whole lot in this little first two verses. Let's get to the rest of it. So we see this now about Zacchaeus, how he didn't allow his present circumstance, okay, his present situation stop him from going to find out about who Jesus was. He wanted to find something out, right? And so think about that. If people don't like you, you kind of want to stay away from the crowd, right? And especially if you're up in a tree, you're an easy target. Everything was going against him. This made no logical sense for him to do what he did. He was a, it'd be like the mayor, if you will, climbing up in a tree. Everyone would be like, man, he should be more dignified than that. Dignity, dignity goes out the window when you're trying to find Christ. Amen. Right? Amen. Undignified. So, he was trying to see who Jesus was, but he could not see because he was short. He ran ahead and, uh, and got up in the tree because he knew Jesus was about to pass that way. Verse 5. When Jesus reached the place, when he reached the place, this is so... Um, this is so God. I mean, I mean, think about this for a minute. When Jesus reached the place, he looked up, and it's, and all and all of a sudden he saw Shorty up in the tree. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must come and stay at your house. At your house. Isn't that just like Jesus? To irritate the religious folk. Right? Just to irritate them. Being led of the Spirit. Coincidence? Not even close. Not even close. Looks up, sees Zacchaeus, and tells him, come down from there, because today I'm coming to stay at your house. Of all the people, of all the people that were around, Jesus sees faith. And he certainly responds to humility. Do you see that now? Of all the people that were in that crowd, Zacchaeus, not a, not a, not a believer, cheating the people quite a bit, had a, extorting money from them, but yet humbled himself to find out and took that step, regardless of what it was going to look like to other people, and Jesus noticed it. Jesus noticed it. His faith, his humility. You see humility there. And because Jesus noticed his humility, he got the, uh, I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus, and I'm staying with you. I'm staying with you. <laughs> this, is, this is incredible. It's incredible. Verse 6, so Zacchaeus hurried, came down, and welcomed Jesus with joy. Now, I, I'm, you know, we, listen, one day we'll get to heaven and we'll be able to talk to him about this um, and ask him. But I wonder at times when I read this, like, what was going through Zacchaeus, his mind now at this point? Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, 
man, I, 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 I hear a lot of good things about this guy. And, and, you know, I've been cheating his people for a long time. <laughs> and now he wants to come and stay at my house. You know, did I? I must have. There's something's wrong here, you know. Um, but he came down. He said he came down and he welcomed Jesus with joy. With joy. Verse 7. When the people saw it. When the people saw it. The judges. The religious people, they began muttering in discontent. He, ha- he, has gone, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a notorious sinner? A notorious sinner. Isn't that why Jesus came? To save those from a sinful life. Whew. But they got mad. Because Jesus said, today I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. I'm coming over by you. We're going to have dinner. And Jesus knew in their heart that they were going to, I was just going to chap them real good. And so uh, he's a notorious sinner. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped. Now, now this is, listen, this is what I really wanted to kind of talk about. This verse 8 through, uh, through 10 here. So we already saw the character of Zacchaeus. We're, Jesus Did you see mercy? Did you see mercy from Jesus? Why was Jesus merciful to Zacchaeus? Because he was humble. Who gets God's help? The humble. Who qualifies for that? Everyone, anybody, and every person who's breathing qualifies for that. He qualified to receive Jesus' help. But see, now what we see here, and so now Jesus set this thing up. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner tonight. I'm going to stay with you. And so Zacchaeus thought, oh, man, hang on a minute. Uh, So you you see it right here in verse 8. Zacchaeus, he stopped. And he said uh, to the Lord, see, Lord, uh, see me. (laughs) He's thinking to himself, he's got to know everything about me. Why does he want to come? And his heart began to convict him. Right? Isn't the goodness of God causes people to repent? It's the goodness of God. The religious people were mad that Jesus would even go to his house and break bread. But God's mercy, because of humility involved here, because of, we see humility, God's mercy was poured out to Zacchaeus. And because his, God's goodness, which is mercy, is causing Zacchaeus now to feel convicted of the way he's been living which is the way it's supposed to happen. That's how it's supposed to happen. So he stopped and said to the Lord, See, Lord, I am now giving half of my possessions to the poor. (laughs) He's like, half of what I have now, I mean, I know you're coming to my house and you're going to see I have a whole lot, but I'm giving half of it all to the poor, just so you know. Just so you know. He said, and if I have cheated anyone out of anything, and he knew he did, I will give back four times as much. I will give back four times as much. This is incredible. We've read this story so many times and just skimmed through it like a good gospel story. There's a lot of application to our lives today in these four verses of Scripture. He said, so listen, if I have cheated anyone... Out of anything, I'm going to give back four times as much to them. Jesus, in verse 9, this is it right here, said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he also is a spiritual son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That which was lost. Zacchaeus and his household received salvation the blessing of the Lord, because Zacchaeus was willing, number one, to humble himself, willing to repent, and repent, and now we're going to get to my my point here, and repentance is not just a wishy-washy feeling. Repentance is associated with a choosing to go a different direction. And we can see that that happened in his life, didn't it? He said... 
Listen, uh, I'm giving half of what I have to the poor. And, and if I have cheated, and he should have said, and because I have cheated, because he knew he did, I'm giving four times as much back to everyone that I robbed from and skimmed from. So, and because of God's mercy and his grace, which was activated because of our choosing to humble ourselves and repent. People don't repent because they make excuses why they don't need to. And, and when things aren't going good in their life, they don't assume responsibility for it. They say it's God in his mysterious ways, which is a big, fat lie. It has nothing to do with God and his mysterious ways. If his ways were so mysterious, he wouldn't give us a book with 66 different writers to show us his way. But people don't want to open this up and see what it says and find out how they can have what God said they can have. And they'll go through life blindfolded and then say, it's the mysterious way of God. And sound all spiritual and you just never know. Well, you just never know. You're right. But we know because we open up the scriptures and we see what Jesus said. And doing what Jesus said comes with a price. It comes with humility. It comes with humility. It's, make, it's doing the thing that logically doesn't make sense to do. It's doing the thing that your mind is telling you you're going to look like a fool if you do. Does everybody see that? So that's the price we pay for following Christ. But is it worth it? You can't even make the, 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 the comparison. Salvation, blessing, eternity in the kingdom of heaven, or what some people who got more skeletons in their closet think about me, I could care less. If I know the Lord told me to walk down my, on my hands down Bay Avenue, I would do it. I mean, he don't tell me to do that because I can't walk on my hands. I wouldn't do it on Bay Avenue anyway. But if he told me to, he'd make it happen some way or another. It'd be stupid. Don't anyone do that. But... Um, I'm just trying to use, make that as an example here. Our <laughs> choice, our choosing to obey when the Spirit of God speaks to us activates His power to do what He said He would do. But it's always, say this, it's always my will and my choice. Always. It always will be. God is never going to do something against your will. Never. The Holy Ghost lives on the inside of us. He's a gentleman. Demonic activity, pressure you. Demons force and pressure. The Holy Spirit nudges, urges, gently guides, still small voice, not screaming, forcing you, coercing you to do anything. It's a choice that we make. And we see that Zacchaeus made that choice. To, he wanted to see Jesus. And I'm sure, if, you know, we don't see it in here, but I'm sure he must have thought, man, there's, there's got to be something wrong with me. Why do I want to see Jesus? I've been stealing from these people. And I got, now everybody's going to see me up in the tree. And never in a million years did Zacchaeus think that Jesus was going to look, it up, <laughs> look at him and say, I'm coming to stay at your house tonight. Think about that for a minute. He must have been like humming, humming, humming. Now what? He said, but wait a minute, Lord. I, I'm giving everything that I have to the poor. And if I cheated people, don't worry. I'm taking care of that too. Four times as much goes back. All right? He received salvation. He received salvation. He received God's help, God's mercy. God wants to pour out his help and his mercy on every person on this earth, especially those that are of the household of God. If he didn't destroy us because of our sin when we were without Christ, why would he want to do anything bad to us now that we are part of his family? Right? He spared us while we weren't yet brought near. He kept us to the, because of his mercy, kept us to the place where we, can, we could have come and received salvation. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. You know, the enemy, what he likes to do is uh, when we make a mistake and we, we miss it, instead of being quick to repent, 
He brings guilt on us. And then we say to ourselves, well, I missed it. I might as well just forget the rest of it. And, and there's no, I've done this so many times. I might as well just forget it and just live the rest of my life because I'm just going to keep making mistakes. That's what the devil comes and does to us, right? You know, Kenneth Copeland said this in his uh, Faith to Faith. Um, he said that uh, <clears throat> don't make the, the mistake don't make that mistake. Don't let Satan talk you into sinning in one area of your life just because you missed it in another. Think about that. When you get off track with God, confess it and get right back on. You can get right back on. You don't have to wallow in the sin. But there's humility in that. There's humility in that. And you know where we see a lack of humility? In the Garden of Eden. Satan the father of pride. They yield to his temptation, Adam and Eve. And instead of immediately when God said, hey, where are you? Like God didn't know where they were. He knew where they were. Where are you? Oh, uh, we're hiding over here because we got no clothes. Wait, because we got no clothes. He said, what do you mean? Who told you you have no clothes? They, right then and there, they should have been like, he should have looked at even and said, listen, it's time to hit our knees. We can't go any further in this. He knows already. He knows, he's asking us how we know we don't have clothes. What are we going to tell him? What are we going to tell him? And so Adam right away, well, God, the woman that you gave me, do you see pride to God? God blessed him with a woman. And he's blaming God for his sin because he gave him this woman. Men are doing that today. <laughs> pride, 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 pride. Pride is rebellion. It separates you from God. You know, I don't know what would have happened if they immediately fell to their knees and repented. I don't know. You know, and said, that's what should have happened. They should have said, God, oh, man, we blew it. It's nobody's fault but mine. And I assume that. I'm sorry for failing you. Please be merciful and forgive me. I'm sure God would have forgiven them and it would have been a different story. However, that has been the practice of mankind since the beginning. It's called the blame game, which is pride. We want to we wanna blame somebody else for the problems that we have in our life today. And... Uh, it's just not the way we are to do it. It's always because of choices that we make. Now, now, you know, at the end of the day, some people are, are afforded better choices than others, and I understand that in society. I do. But still, at the end of the day, it comes down to us choosing what we're going to do. You know, I, I, watched, uh, I watched a news clip, I don't know, last week sometime. I think it was Lou Holt. Or something wasn't was he the, the the coach for Notre Dame? Yeah, Lou Holtz. And uh, man, what a firecracker that guy is! Still, I mean, I'm like he's tall. I couldn't even keep up with what he was saying. He's like blah, 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 mile a minute. I'm like, holy cow! And and uh, but it, it, but what he was saying, I mean, he was he was on uh, one of the news channels, and uh, and he was saying as a as a uh, coach, he would mentor. He felt most important mentoring these young men. On his team. And he said this if we would teach people all through society to make right choices, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. But people are making wrong choices and they're getting wrong results. And, 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 and you know what? The scriptures tell us we're snared by the words of our mouth. And what's coming out of our mouth is based on what we've been putting into us, what we've been looking at, and what we've been listening to. So therefore, you're never going to make a good choice or a God choice if you're listening to things that the world is feeding to us. Lies, deception, reason, fear, and all those things. Right? But he said, if we, if we could teach young people and teach parents to teach their children that you need to make good choices, doesn't matter what side of the track you're on. He said, I was raised in a poor, very poor family. We had nothing. 
Nothing, he said. Have you ever read? I, I didn't know that about him because you look at him as what a great success story. But he said, my success came because my parents instilled in me that I can have better if I choose better. And he said, you know what? I chose better. I chose that I'm not going to be a, a victim to this. I'm not a victim. I'm going to conquer it, and I'm going to choose something different. And he did, and, and, and that's what he said. He, you know, now we know the Word of God, and that is scriptural, right? It is scriptural. And, uh, and so, but what we see here in this story is we see the mercy of God, the goodness of God. And that goodness and that mercy is for this generation. God, it's not his will that any human being on this planet, I don't care geographically where you're at, should die and go to hell. Not one of them. Now, we look at people and be like, ah, they deserve hell. Listen, we all deserved hell. Every one of us. Every one of us. So we are not to judge. And if you don't want to be judged, then just look at yourself and no one else. But God, it's his will. And he sent Jesus to be the, 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 the payment for every person on this planet. Now, people will humble themselves and accept it. Others won't. Right? But it's not God's will because someone chooses not to receive salvation. It, you can't say, well, it must have just been God's will. How can you say that? What about the person's will? They're human. They could choose. They, they're not robots. It's not like God only programmed you know, people born on even days are going to get salvation. The, those who are born on, and I picked even because I'm born on even, but uh, those who are on odd days are, are, won't. You know, Then... There's no choice. Then there's no choice. But we always have a choice. And you know what? We could choose when conviction comes on our heart. We can choose to harden our heart. And, and I know most people would say, well, I'm not hardening my heart. Of course that's what we would say. Because the devil's not going to come to you and say, harden your heart. Get real rebellious and refuse. Stand up with a sign. He's not going to do that to you. But he's going to come to you with thoughts of people are going to think you're weird. Your family's going to reject you. Right? Think, listen, that, that's what he's going to come with. Not, oh, just rebel because it's all nonsense. No, it's going to be like, uh, look, your family's going to think you're nuts. Um, you know, you, you have a good career, and now the church is going to want money from you. All this kind of stuff that he comes with, right? And, uh, and so what will happen is we'll choose to listen to that. And that leads us to rebellion and pride. It leads us away from salvation. It leads us away from mercy. And it leads us away from his goodness. And that, that, that's the battle. That is the configuration that happens all the time. That, that's the way it goes. But um, going back to what uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland said, um, he, he, he was saying he used to think that way. And we've all been guilty of that, lead, yielding to that thought and that temptation. Well, I messed it up in this area. There's just no way I'm ever going to do it. And then and the devil's like, yeah, that's right. You're a bum. Just go just go do something else now. You know, and then you go down that road. And it just gets darker and worse, you know. And, uh, and so he said, he used to think that way too. And then God said to him one day, he said, Kenneth, when you confess that sin wasn't when I found out about it. Think about that for a minute. Think about that. That is so, that's profound. We think that the minute we confess it, that's when God's like, oh, what? You did that? <laughs> I cannot believe you did. You're supposed to be a Christian. That's what the devil says to us, right? That's not the, this is what he said to him. That's not when I found out about it. I knew about it all the time. When you confessed it is when you got rid of it. When you were cleansed of its effect in your life. Confession. Repentance. That's what Jesus came preaching. His kingdom and repentance. But now there's a big difference between repentance and turning away and uh, being ashamed because you got caught. Does everybody understand that? Repentance makes changes. Which is a sign of humility. Humility. Rebellion makes excuses, 
which is a sign of pride, which is what I just described with Adam and Eve. Uh, let's make an excuse. Instead of Adam saying, you know what? I know I'm naked because I ate of that tree and you told me not to. And I know it's going to be bad, but please be merciful to me. Take your medicine, <laughs> right? But he didn't. He didn't humble himself and ask for God's mercy. He blamed God. He didn't even blame Eve. He blamed God for giving her to him. Pride. And he blamed her too. First he started with God. He said, you know, the woman you gave me, she, she told me. And then, and then he said, yeah, Eve, look, you made me eat this thing. And now we're naked. <laughs> Rebellion makes excuses. It's pride. Pride separates us from God. Pride is sin. And, and I, I, when I was preparing this and thinking about this, and I have so many more scriptures. I wish I had so much more time, but I don't because we have communion today as well. But uh, I thought about this. How many have ever taken an Uber ride somewhere? I have. I had an Uber ride from hell from Philadelphia airport with a guy. It was his first Uber trip, and he lived in Delaware, and he had to take me to Tom's River. I thought it, I was going to see Jesus that night. I did. And if this guy didn't pull over, he was going to see someone too because I was in the back seat. I'm like, listen, dude, pull your car over now. I understand you're flustered, but you don't know where you're going. Can I drive the car? I'll get us right where we have to go. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, that's fine, but I want to get home. My wife's a nervous wreck, and you're taking me. I, I'm not going back to Delaware. Anyway, so it, it was a bad experience. I, I should have I never done that. Anyway, but, but I got to witness to him, preach Jesus to him, and I gave him a real hefty tip when he dropped me off. So all in all, we're, we're here, thank God. But anyway, uh, if you've ever been in an Uber driver, and, and this was the example that the Lord gave me, and they were going the wrong way, right? Like my guy was clearly going the wrong way and and you know part I, I think I was making him very nervous too but but my wife was making me nervous see I'm blaming my wife but uh but she, she <laughs> and and it was getting you know it was getting real tense in the car so uh it had windows taped up they weren't even glass in the way I'm like dude my wife's like are you getting in we're getting in this car I'm like Melissa it's one o'clock in the morning we're in Philadelphia you have another plan I mean uh, you know I, I don't know I guess I could have made a lot more phone calls, but I didn't want to bother anyone. So anyway, but if you've ever been in a, with an Uber driver and, uh, and they were going the wrong way, right? Now, if you say, hey, listen, you're going the wrong way, and he's like, oh, man, I am really sorry about that. I'm sorry, but doesn't make any correction and just keeps going the same direction. Is there really, is he sorry? Of course not. And, and, and I know that may not sound like, a, like a, a good illustration, but when we repent, when we say we're sorry, there needs to be a complete directional change. You cannot be truly repentant and sorry and still stay on the same path that you were just walking. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? In other words, if I'm going down this road here and I'm, I'm, I'm yielding to the flesh, I'm doing a lot of things that I shouldn't, and either I get caught or finally things turn real bad and I say to myself, man, I got to get off of this path. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And he's like, you're cleansed, you're forgiven, but I just keep going down the same path and I don't turn on to a new direction, then am I really Sorry. How could I really expect a different result doing the same thing? Repentance, confession, confessing to God, receiving his mercy involves us making a directional change in our life. If there's no directional change, well, what would be a directional change? Well, if, if, if alcohol is your problem, you know what's a good change? Don't go to the liquor store anymore, Right? Or, or, or drive past the bar that you used to go to all the time. You know? I'm just using these as an example. It, it could be anything. It, it could be whatever. If you are trying to make a change and you're asking God to forgive you in your life, then we need to find a different direction to go. 
and then follow that. And that doesn't mean that you might make a mistake on this new direction, because you, you probably will, but that's when we go to 1 John 1, 9, and we say, Father, I'm sorry for failing. I'm sorry for missing it here. I, I repent. And it's when we do that, God already knew that we made the mistake. It's when we repent of it that we're free from it again. And I cannot believe I totally ran out of time. I wanted to read, I've got a couple more minutes here, and uh, I want to read 2 Samuel to you, because we can see this. I didn't intend to spend that much time in Luke, but, uh, but it's good. It's helping us, right? Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we're going to start here in verse 1. This is a little story about David. Now, what do we know about David? We know that if God can use David, he can use me. (laughs) That's what we know. (laughs) And I don't say that because I'm judging him. I'm thankful that he made more mistakes than me. I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) uh, But there's something about David's character that is what we, need to, what we need to see. And you can see the mercy of God. Mercy of God and, and, and forgiveness is always attached to our confession and humility. Always. You can't receive forgiveness for something that you won't admit you did. Right? And a lot of times, we won't just come out and say we did it. We're guilty. We'll make excuses. We'll go all the way around to reason and and pull other people in as to why we are this way. And the truth of the matter is, it's pride. We should just say, I'm this way because I yield to my flesh. And God would be more happy with that than doing the blame game, right? And you'd get free. That's the better part. So here we see, and, uh, and, and if you want to get the rest of the story, I'm not going to read, especially now for, for time's sake, but uh, 1 Samuel, the beginning in chapter 11 in the first verse, talks about what led up to what we're going to read right now in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it's about David, and the story goes, uh, David, instead of being out at, in, at battle with his men, was home, and he walks out on the roof. He sees Uriah, who, his wife, who's a... Who's a uh, a leader like a general in in his army. He sees his wife bathing Bathsheba. He likes what he sees, and because he's a king, he uh, he brings her over, you know, and and um, and then he makes up a bunch of lies. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. Uh, he tries to get Uriah to to go back and spend some time with his wife, so that Uriah will think that it's his kid. And Uriah says, "No, king, I need to be with my men." Oh. My Gosh, could you imagine talking about sticking the knife? I need to be with my men on the battlefield. And so what does David resort to next? Murder. Has him killed. All right? Um, <clears throat> so that was chapter 11. Chapter 12 is this. Thank God for the prophet, right? Nathan. Nathan comes along. The Lord sends Nathan. Now here's God's... Uh, and now this is old covenant. You know, we're under new covenant now. But the principle is the same. Here's God's uh, uh, providence saying, listen, I'm giving you an opportunity here. I'm going to show you what you've done is wrong. And the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David. He came and said to him this. Tells him this story. There were two men in a city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb. Which, had, which he had purchased and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It was their little family lamb. It ate his food, drank from his cup, and it laid in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. All right? Now, a traveler or a visitor came to the rich man, needing and to avoid the rich man, and to avoid taking one from his own flock or herd, To prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for his guest. And everyone would be like, wow, that is awful. And it is, but there's a point here. I mean, that is sad. You know, this guy had a bunch of lambs, and he took this guy's pet. So anyway, (laughs) scoundrel. Verse 5, then... (laughs) 
Then David's, but think about this. This is a story that God has instructed Nathan to say to David. I mean, then David's anger burned intensely against this rich man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Clueless. Clueless. He shall make restitution for the ewe lamb four, notice that word, four times as much. I just saw that. I don't know what that means, but that's what Zacchaeus said too. I'll give back four times as much. So anyway. Um, <clears throat> Restitution for the ewe lamb, four times as much as the lamb was worth because he did this thing and he had no, com no compassion. you got to think to yourself, and without being judgmental for a minute, because we've been as ignorant as this as well, but like what is going through David's head? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? He's ready. He's thinking to himself, can we get that far in our pride that we reason? That's a dangerous place. Super dangerous. People are that deluded in their thinking that, 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 that we want to cast judgment on others when we have been so far from what the perfect picture that God has for us. This is David here doing the same thing. Burned intensely. Said he deserves to die. He shall make restitution, pay back four, months, four, four times as much. Verse 7, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you as king over Israel, and I spared you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and put your master's wives into your care and under your protection. And I gave you the house, the royal dynasty of Israel and of Judah. And if that, had, if that had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Verse 10, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Verse 11, thus says the Lord, behold, I will stir up evil against you from your own household. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and in broad daylight. Now, you see how God looks at sin in those verses. But it would have ended there had David not responded the way he did. This is so important for us to see. You see, there is always a penalty for sin. There was, that's why Jesus came. But there is a consequence of sin. You know, sin is for a season. But the, the, the payoff is death. The scriptures tell us that. Um, verse 13. Here, there's a choice that had to be made in verse 13. Now, we're going to see David make the right choice. God gives us his word to convict us of where we're wrong, where we're missing it. The, the, the word came from the prophet Nathan to David. And when we receive God's word, we can either receive it with humility and gladness, even though it's showing us and convicting us of things that need to be corrected in our life. That's why nobody needs to tell you how to live. If you'll read his word, the Holy Ghost will show you clearly how we are to live. Every one of us. Every one of us. And see, God does that through the Holy Spirit to the church. And he shows us and he gives us his word. And his word is to keep us in track, keep us on the right path, keep us checking our heart. Are we being convicted of things that need to change? And if we choose to change them, we invite his mercy and help into our life to restore us, to bless us, to prosper us, to help us. But if we harden our heart through pride and reason and all other kind of things that the enemy will bring to us, we cut ourselves off. And judgment 
gets passed. Does everybody see that? David said, after hearing this, thank God David didn't say, yeah, but hold on. It wasn't my fault. He should have not let his wife bathe outside like that. I was doing king business, and I happened to see her, and he could have reasoned, he could have blamed, he could have made all kinds of excuses. But thank God that's not what we see. Here's the example we have. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also had, has allowed your sin to pass without further punishment. You shall not die. You shall not die. You see immediately when there is a confession, a humility, a humbling ourselves and taking. Listen, friend, I know it's not easy to swallow the pill and take your medicine when you've done wrong. But there's a remedy for that. Don't do wrong. <laughs> and you won't have to swallow the big pill. But if you do, take your medicine. Don't cover your sin. Don't try to hide it. You'll never be free from it. The, the, the object is to not get there in the first place. But if we find ourselves there, repent. Bring it before the Lord. He sees it anyway. You find deliverance from it in his grace when you confess it to him. But when we make excuses and we keep going the wrong way, we just dig a deeper, deeper hole. And then one sin needs to cover up another sin. And then one lie covers another lie. And then, then, then you have went from a snowball to a boulder. And it's crushing you at this point. When? It's going to be tough. But just come out and say it. And say, I'm wrong. I did it. I did. And I am God awfully sorry. Whether you hurt somebody, whether you did something wrong, you, you, you got you to gotta come clean with it. You have to. Go to the Lord, and you have to be honest, and you have to take your medicine. If you're big boy enough to do it, then be big enough to take the consequences. And if you don't like the consequences, then the lesson is don't do it in the first place. You don't have to worry about lying if everything you're doing is right. There's no reason to lie. David received grace and favor from God because he, he repented. He said, I am sorry. And you know what we see later on, and I mean, that's just the beginning. There's Psalm 51, which is the whole uh, 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 psalm of David about repenting and, and bringing me near, cleansing me, creating a right heart and a clean heart within me. And, uh, and, and David received mercy from God, just like we shall receive God's mercy in our life if we'll humble ourselves and confess to him. And the first step in that is receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, because you don't have acts. First John 1 John 1.9 is written to believers. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But the first step is it humbling yourself and saying, God, I, I recognize I'm not in control of my own destiny. And, and, and sometimes we just equate that with people who are down and out. You could be on top. It's for those that are on top as well. That naturally looking, they got it all together. But what good is it if we amass all this for 80 years on this earth and then lose our life and spend eternity in hell? It's, it's a vapor. Anything we have here is just a puff of smoke and gone. We need to be preparing for after here, after here. And you know, in, in, in spite of what happened in David's life, and he, he, you know, he, he sowed some seed there and some things happened to him, but he was considered... A friend of God. Don't you want to be considered God's friend? How, how, how does God consider us his friend? By humbling ourselves, keeping our heart right before him. And friend, listen, I, I, I ministered this today because the mercy of God is a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, God is not mad at us. God cannot look favorably on sin. And sin left unchecked brings death. It brings destruction to our lives. God does not want that for his church, for his children. No more than as a natural parent would want to see my kids go through anything that's going to hurt them. And I do everything in my power to, uh, to, to, to see that that doesn't happen. But they have choices as well. Right? And so, you know, if something did, you can't say it was my will. 
And it's not God's will that anything bad happen to his children. But we got to come to the place of reconciling our heart before him. A place of repentance, a place of humility. A place of humility and go a different direction. Hear from the Spirit of God, keep his word alive in your heart, and then follow him all the way. And if you make a mistake on the journey, be quick to repent. Be quick to say, God, I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm not going to continue going that way. Help me. Help me to do right. Help me to do right. Amen. Glory to God. I wanted to encourage you with that word this morning. We are going to receive uh, communion today. And I, I think it's a good uh, to talk about the, the, the body and the blood of Jesus. Because it's his blood that cleanses us. Right? It's his blood that makes us whole. It's his blood that restores us. And it's the goodness of God, which we saw in the scriptures today, that leads people to repent. Not a message. God's not sitting on a bullhorn yelling, stop or I'm sending you to hell. It's not what he's saying. He's not what he's saying. He's saying, stop your sin, receive forgiveness, and let me help you. Let me help you. And so I'm going to uh, just ask this today. Uh, while the ushers are, are getting ready to pass out the communion elements, with no one looking around, the Bible says that, uh, that we are to examine our hearts, examine our own life. Um, and really what that means is check our motive in doing what we're doing and how we're living. You know, and only you as an individual, myself as an individual, can, uh, can know the true intent true intent. And so I ask you today to examine your own heart and as we receive these emblems that represent the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and we do this to remember what he did for us. And friend, Jesus suffered brutally in his human body, pain and anguish and shed his blood and was nailed with spikes through his hands and through his feet to a piece of wood so that we could have eternal life. His blood was shed so that we can boldly come to him and repent and ask for his forgiveness and receive his help. And so today I'm asking you to examine your heart. Listen to the Holy Ghost on the inside. If you don't know what that is, listen to that, that, um, that feeling, that uneasy, maybe you'd describe it, uh, that, that you, you know you need to do something. Well, that's the Spirit of God. That's the job of the Holy Ghost to convict us of, of wrong living and sin and our need to repent. Pride will keep you from doing it and it'll destroy your life. But the gift of God is eternal life. It's eternal life. So as we take this moment before we receive the, these emblems, that represent what Jesus did for us, healing our bodies, forgiving our sins. Check your own heart today. And if you don't know Jesus Christ personally, he doesn't want to know you through a religion, through a bunch of rules and regulations, uh, laws that he knows you can't keep. He wants to know you through personal fellowship, living fellowship, meaning get up in the morning and talk to you. Talk to him. Tell him what you're thinking. Listen to his answers living fellowship, communion. Let's all pray this prayer together today. So we receive the, 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 the body and the blood in a worthy, right heart, right manner. Let's say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the gift of salvation. I thank you that you've made a way for us to spend eternity with you by confessing our sins, by repenting and turning away and then picking up our cross and following you daily. I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you to cleanse me of all sin, all unrighteousness, all filth and shame I repent of. I ask you to create a clean heart, a right heart in me now. I thank you that rem you remove my sin and iniquity as far as the east is from the west.
And I thank you that this day I declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. And my name today is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you prayed that for the first time, after service, please, we're going to be in the back. You can stop by our reception center. We want to know we have some material that we want to give you and, uh, and, and help you on this new journey of faith. If you've prayed that and you're watching us online, that's the first time you prayed that prayer. You are now part of the family of God. Please comment on the feed. Our pastoral staff is watching, and we want to reach out to you, get you the materials that you need, and uh, get you, if you're in this area, get you plugged in here or wherever you may be. Find a church that you can grow in. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Everybody receive their, uh, their communion elements? Glory to God. Let me get mine. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Isn't the Lord good? He's so wonderful. Thank you, Father. You know, he loves you. He loves you with a love that I, we just really can't comprehend. But he does. He's not mad at you. He's not, he's not uh, ashamed of you. He loves you. He cares about you. He cares about you more than you could ever imagine. There's nothing that you can do that could ever separate you from his love. Nothing. There's no depth. There's no height. There's no width. There's nothing that could separate you from his love for you. For you. You are his children. You are his prized possession. And he cares about you. So much that he gave his son to die on the cross for us. And that's what we're commemorating and remembering as we receive the, the, uh, these emblems, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> uh, Paul said in Corinthians, instructing them about receiving communion, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and the 23rd verse, he said, For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Father, we received the gift of life, that broken body that was beaten for us, to heal us, to save us, and to set us free. We receive this in reverence and honor of what you've done. Thank you, Lord. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is my cup. This is the cup, the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That that blood still flows today. That that blood is alive, speaking, declaring, conquering, forgiving, restoring us. Thank you for the precious blood, the power that's in the blood. We receive it today with reverence and honor and thanksgiving and declare that we are made righteous, brought near by the blood of Jesus. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Guys, thank you so much for being here, for being an attentive congregation. Uh, the Lord is good. Amen. Why don't we stand up on our feet? Thank him for his goodness as we leave today. Thank him that his blessing and his word is working mightily in us. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. We declare that your word is working in us. We are not just hearers, but we are doers of the word. And your word said that those who do it will be blessed in everything that they do. And so, Father, we expect that in our lives. We thank you that your word does not return void, but it is accomplishing what it's been sent forth to do, and that the Holy Ghost will continue to sh reveal and to show and to quicken to us everything that we need to walk and live victoriously for you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic afternoon, and we will see you uh, again. Uh, we have our faith and healing class on Tuesday. And remember, that class is not just, you don't have to enroll. You can come and join at any time. If you only come once a week, then you come once a week, but you will be blessed. Have a great afternoon. God bless you.